Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The basis of our meditation this morning comes from the gospel lesson just read. Jesus said to his disciples about the coming times, he said, They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is the word of the Lord. Things in life may be harder than they first appear. While children are a blessing from the Lord, you likely didn't realize how much work it would be when you had them. Having them is one thing. Raising them is quite another. Maybe pregnancy was like that for you. How bad can it really be? Then nine months rolled around, and the pain of childbirth was beyond bearable. Maybe marriage for you was a cakewalk, at least when you first started. Walking down the aisle seemed easy, even sensible. Spending the life with the person you loved seemed like something you would never grow tired of. The gas of love and the tank of life surely would never run dry. But maybe you've reached one of those challenging points where it is not so easy as it first once was. Some of our students are home. How hard can going to college really be? It seems fun, right? At least that is what everyone says. But when the tests and papers roll around and you're away from mom and dad and you have to do your own laundry, make your own decisions with the pressures and temptations all around you, you sometimes dig some holes for yourself that you weren't able to dig yourselves out of. We've all been there. Yesterday was Armed Forces Day. The advertisements of soldiers in uniform may have seemed appealing, but in the thick and thin of it, maybe you realize that what you signed up for was the hardest thing you ever did. Sometimes you think back and you say, if I knew how hard it was, I would never have done it. But sometimes you realize that, though that may have been the case, you know the Lord is blessing you. You know it is His good He is working in your life through the blessed cross. And you know that through pain and failure, He has worked the best things imaginable in you. Your trust not being in yourself, but only in Him. You have to admit the Lord accomplishes a lot in our lives by getting us to agree to things that we never would have done would we have known how difficult they would be. We're on the doorstep of Pentecost. The disciples just spent 40 days with the Lord. They saw him ascend into heaven. They're ecstatic, worshiping in the temple with great joy, praising the Lord with all of their hearts. Jesus commanded them to go to all the world and preach the gospel, but likely it's a bigger job than any of them imagined. It is going to be harder than they realized because the world won't welcome them. Why won't everyone love Jesus? They will be hated by all for Christ's sake. The disciples can't imagine such things. They think everything is going to go great and be easy. Only later will they realize how hard it will really be. Being a Christian also is not easy. Probably it is the hardest thing that you have ever done. Loving Jesus is not always so simple. Doubts and hardships daily plague you. You always have to wrestle with yourself. You see so much wrong in yourself. You see so much that you do not want to change. You want to keep your little idols or your little sins, and you don't want to work at them. Sometimes believing that God will love you or that you are a believer seems the hardest thing to believe. Being baptized was easy. You wore the white robe, the water poured over your head while the cross was placed on your forehead and your heart. Little did you realize one was placed on your back as well. It's easy to be a Christian. Easy to start, that is. It is not so easy to finish or remain. But it is finishing that makes all the difference. 
Years ago, I traveled to a town in Austria. It was only later when I realized why there were so many statues of St. Christopher around. My favorite saint, of course. Uh, St. Christopher was the patron saint of miners, and there were many salt mines in that area. When those miners went to church on Sunday, they were given courage as they looked at Christopher. It wasn't always easy to go into those mines. They were reminded of the legend of Christopher. Christopher is not a saint. He is really every one of us. It is a legend that is meant to represent the Christian life. Christopher is often pictured overly large and strong. As a legend goes, in the days before modern roads and bridges, strong Christopher came to a place in the river where many people crossed. There was a small child next to the river. Take me over, he said to Christopher. Christopher, with his broad shoulders and strong arms, said to himself as he looked at the small child, Well, it seems easy to me. I would like to do a good work for this small boy. So he put the child on his shoulders. In the pictures of Christopher, represented in the Middle Ages, in the middle of the river you see the frantic fear on this large man's face. Strong Christopher had misjudged it quite so. The river was much deeper than he had imagined. Carrying this small child at first seemed like an easy and light thing. But as the water swirled about his neck and the current threatened him, and as his feet slipped on the rocks, he realized how hard it was to carry this child and not let go. Luther would write about St. Christopher, speaking about him to the saints in Wittenberg. Every Christian is a Christopher, for the name Christopher is Greek and means bearer of Christ. We bear or carry Christ. Christ goes with us. It seems an easy thing, but it is not so easy. Jesus talked about that with his disciples as he spoke to them on this day. The world will hate you, because they hate me. But why could people hate Jesus? After all, look at what he's done. What isn't there to love about Jesus? Why would people hate him? Well, Jesus tells them very clearly, the world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Well, that makes a lot of sense then, because I'm associated with Jesus the Jesus who bears witness to the evil of the world's ways. The world hates me because as a follower of Jesus, I am not a part of the people of this world. Jesus further explains to his disciples that everyone in the world who hates the light does not come to the light so that their deeds should be exposed. You'd think that people living in a cave would want to come out and to see the colors of the day. But it is easier to live in darkness and what you know. No one wants them to allow God to judge their lives. The words that we speak of our confession, I am a poor, miserable sinner, are the hardest words to say. If I admit that, then it opens up a new world as to the desperate wrongness of who I am in my being, and my place also before an almighty judging God. How difficult it will be to be a disciple in the world. It will be hard as we face a world that is hostile to us simply because we believe in sin. It will be hard for us as we daily wrestle with this truth of sin in us, as we find ourselves more sickening than we should ever be. The world has a solution to make things easier. Walk away from the light. Sometimes we think that if we limit Jesus in our life, our lives could be a whole lot easier and better. Instead of caring Jesus and bearing Jesus to a sinful world, Lord, let's just hold hands once in a while, maybe just in church on Sunday. So what do we do then? 
with the truth of the difficulty that we face as Christians in this world and how it will be more challenging than we think at first go. Well, I've spoken to you the law, but take heart and hear the lessons of today that give wonderful comfort and preach it to you in your mind and heart. First, recognize what a wonderful work God has done in you. Despite sin, the Holy Spirit works in you. You love Jesus, and you desire to follow him, and you don't want Christ to leave. All of that is not what you have done, you see. It is what God has done. God does it, and his word has accomplished it. We could never do such things. Of ourselves, we're idolaters. We heard that good news of the Old Testament lesson of what God did for the people in Babylon. God has made us into the church. God has done this. God took them out of the lands that they were exiled in. God brought them back after they had profaned him with their evil deeds. God put in them a new heart. God gave them a new spirit. What they did was sin and go astray. What God did was bring them back and make them right with him again. This is what God has done for you and Jesus on the cross. It is all of his work, all of it, and he will do it again and again. And next, after the Old Testament lesson for today, we read Psalm 51, and that's a curious psalm. It seems strange to us. Why are we saying this psalm of Lent here already in Pentecost, or as we're on the threshold thereof? Before the big feast, we need to confess. What of the old ways of death have we let creep in again? Before we go out to the world and proclaim the message of sin and grace, we must first bow at the foot of the cross and recognize the great sinfulness of who we are and what we have done. And so Psalm 51, we ask that question, what of the ways of the world have we allowed ourselves to participate in? Are you addicted to pornography as David was? Guess what? There's good news. Jesus forgives. Cleanse me with hyssop, David says, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Our minds are all distorted. We see people as sexual objects. Instead of dying for them, we want them to serve our urges. We fail to see people as people. We're all messed up. But the purifying water of life poured from Jesus flows even to us. If you've looked at things or people this week wrongly, take communion, for the blood of Jesus cleanses you of all sins. And then the Apostle Peter gave us a list in the epistle of things to do. And sometimes lists are very helpful, especially in an evil world and sinful life where we wonder, what are we to do? We know what we should be doing and not doing and how God wants us to live and to love. Be self-controlled, he said. Be sober-minded. Keep your mind and life in check. Don't let your mind race. Keep things focused. Don't deal with too much. Turn from things that get your mind off track of Jesus. And Peter goes on, love one another. One another, he means the body of Christ. Show hospitality to each other. Focus your love on each other in the congregation. Work on the good of this place here. If you have a gift, then use it, but do so without grumbling. Do so without looking over your shoulder or being resentful. If you can speak, then speak and use that gift for your people here, for not everyone can. If you can serve, then serve. Focus on the things here. And focus also on these things in your jobs and in the community where you live. Keep your head down. If the world speaks against us, may they not do so as evildoers, but see our good works and praise our Father who is in heaven. And finally, how can we face the work and world and the future that is harder than we can ever imagine it? Jesus does deal in this gospel lesson with the persecution that they will face. But before he even says that, he says some very comforting news in the very heart of what we confess about what we have as Christians. What is the good news, and what does it all come down to? Simply, Jesus gives the Holy Helper, the Spirit is able. I'm not able, you're not able, the church isn't able, but God is able. 
And the Spirit, Jesus says, bears witness. He gives you what you need, all that you need. He talks to you, the Spirit does, about Jesus. And you can't help talking about him to your friends and family and your neighbors. Oh yes, they will put you out of the synagogues. They may say all manner of things that are evil against you. But Jesus is not leaving you alone. You're not orphans. You are his. Made children in baptism. You have a father in heaven. You have a church that you call home. You have brothers and sisters to lean upon who will forgive you and, and pardon you. You have a pastor to give you absolution. And you have a big brother, Jesus, who went to the cross even for you. For at the conclusion of this Easter season, we confess that Jesus has won. He defeated the devil. He has beat your sins and Satan at his game. You have fellowship with God, what Jesus came for. He clothes you with his victory, and so rejoice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please. The peace of God which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ.